Amos chapter 3. Now in the month of June of this year, I was speaking at a conference for the Chinese believers in Los Angeles area in the US. During those days, there was a tragic incident that happened in the US. In a black church, maybe you have heard about this, a white boy, about 15, 17 years old, entered into the church while they were having their midday Bible study. A small group, about 15 people. And this boy came into the church before the meeting started and he befriended the pastor. And uh, the, he appeared genuine. So after the little talk, then the whole uh, small group, about 15 people gathered together to sing some songs. And he also sang songs. He lifted up his hands and he worshipped. And then they sat down to study the Bible. A few minutes after they started studying the Bible, this boy started asking some very contradictory questions. And the pastor was very kind to answer his questions. And he, then he became a little rowdy. You know, and then he got up, pulled out his gun from his back and shot everyone point blank. He shot everyone. The first was the pastor. And then one by one he shot everybody and then he came to one big woman. She was already shivering. He pointed the gun straight at her head. Just like this. And she was shaking, you know. And he said, uh, I'm not going to kill you. I'm leaving you alive because you need to go and tell everybody what happened here. And eventually the boy was caught and uh, you know the rest of the story, right? But every day, from morning to night, all the four major news networks in the U.S. carried the story. So one afternoon, I sat and while I was lunching, I turned on the news and I was watching this whole procedure. And as I was looking, I suddenly remembered that two years ago, the Lord revealed to me that there will come racial riots in the U.S. And it will be the white and the blacks. And the white will attack the black people. And as a result, it will cause communal racial problems in the U.S. As I was looking at the news, oh, when this dawned on me, I saw the Lord Jesus walk into my room. And he came and he sat beside me on the sofa. And we were watching the news. He didn't speak any word. I didn't speak any word. We were just watching the news. And then when I remembered what the Lord revealed to me, I turned around and I told the Lord, Lord, you revealed this to me two years ago. Look, it has come to pass. I was very proud that, or just joyful that, the prophecy that I gave came to pass. Till then the Lord kept quiet. As soon as I said, you know, you revealed that to me two years ago. He turned around, looked at me and he said, but what did you do about that? As soon as he asked that question, I felt like a sort went into me. And a kind of a holy fear came upon me and I dropped to my knees. And uh, I, I said, Lord, what do you mean what I did about that? Then the Lord told me, I revealed this thing to you two years ago. You shared that to the world. But what more did you do with that revelation? So I pondered and I pondered and I pondered. I said, Lord, I don't think I did anything about it. What should I have done? Then the Lord told me, when I reveal something, it is not just to prophesy what is going to come to pass, but secrets are revealed for prayer. If the body of Christ were marshaled, gathered together, Okay, 
there's going to come a racial problem in the U.S., the whites against the blacks, or the blacks will rise up against the white. Okay, get all the churches to pray. If they had prayed, this thing could have been prevented. You know, I, I trembled like a leaf that day. I said, oh my, this is my fault. So that day I realized one thing. A prophet should not only prophesy, but also marshal the people to do something. Don't just stop at proclamation, but need to go one step further by marshalling the people. Okay, come on. At least the awareness of prayer. Okay, this is what God has spoken. Everybody start praying. So when you start praying, then the thing concerning that revelation, the minute parts, see, a prophet does not, God does not reveal everything to a prophet. Just an outline. So when the outline is given, now you take it. And when you start praying, then the tiny bits of puzzles, say 1, 2, 3, 4, right? 1.1, 1.2, what we reveal to you? What we can do? Or 2.1, 2.2, what to do? All the things that are in between, the nitty gritty things, how to put it into action, or what we can do to prevent this from happening. Some things are doomed to come to pass. There's nothing you can do. But there are some things that can be prevented from happening. The things that are doomed to pass, when the people of God pray, the effects can be minimized. It will come to pass. But the effects can be minimized so that the after effects are not paramountal to a great deal. It can be safe. A very good example Okay, let's go to Amos chapter 3. Amos chapter 3 and the verse 7. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but He reveals His secrets unto His servants, the prophets. Now the word secret in the original Hebrew language means revealing of plans or Revealing of secret counsels. So which means, before God does anything, there are two, two kinds of prophets. One is the prophets in the earth. And the other is the prophets counsel in heaven. I already shared, we already discussed all that this past one and a half days. So we don't need to go any more into that thing. So, God calls his counsel. Say, this is what I am going to do. What do you all think about it? What? And he announces his plans. Of course, you know, when God announces a plan, who will dare to say, Lord, I think. <laughs> Nobody will dare to say, I think this, I think that, like we do on the earth. Right? No, no. They will all say, yes, Lord, it shall be done. Or sometimes, you know, sometimes the Lord asks us for opinions. What do you think about this? And of course, all our earthly opinions are all tainted with flaws, with self. Right, isn't it? In the year 1985, I had an encounter with the Lord. I was fasting for 40 days. On one of the days, the Lord Jesus appeared to me and he stretched out his hand. And when he stretched out his hand, I saw a baby. And he asked me, what do you... Th and that baby, the face of the baby, looked like one of a church member. Only the face looked like her, the rest was like a baby, and she was big enough to sit on his one palm. And the Lord asked me, what do you think about this baby? I said, Lord, this is so and so. And he asked me, what do you think about her? This was a moment I was waiting for all my life. And then I told the Lord, Lord, this girl is a pain in my neck. True. 
you know, whenever there's a problem in the church, she's the foundress. There's a gossiping, murmuring, backbiting that goes on in the church. She is the queen behind all that. And I, I told the Lord all the things that this girl does. Everything. You should not hide anything, you know. So I told the Lord everything. <laughs> Every pastor would wait for such a golden opportunity, you know. See, pastors are not supposed to gossip, right? But when the Lord himself is asking, what do you think? <laughs> then this is your golden opportunity. <laughs> Isn't it? So I told the Lord everything. I said, Lord, you know, this girl is a real pain to me, Lord. Why did you brought her into my life? <laughs> I led her to you. I baptized her in the water. I prayed for her to get baptism of the Holy Spirit. I prayed for her day and night. I brought her up like my own daughter. And look what Lord she has done to me. And I told the Lord one by one by one. And he listened. He was so patiently listening to me with a little smile on his face. And after I was through, he said, come and stand beside me. So I came and stood beside him. He said, come and stand directly behind me. So... You know, the lot is six footer. And I'm shorter. But when I stood beside the lot, it seemed that I was about his height. And he said, put your eyes directly behind my eyes. So I put my eyes directly behind his eyes. And he said, now see. When I saw through the eyes of the Lord Jesus, that girl, she looked so different. All the flaws that I spoke earlier were not there. I saw this girl so beautiful. Not in the flesh, but in the heart. All the flaws were not there. I said, well, what happened? She looked so kind. She looked so humble, which is not in the natural. <laughs> I was shocked. I said, Lord, what is this? Then the Lord Jesus said, This is how my Father sees all of you through my eyes. This is the meaning of the scripture. You are justified in me. You are completed in me. You are sanctified in me. You are complete in me. This is what it means. The Father sees through my eyes. When He sees through my eyes, you appear beautiful. That is the reason why my father is able to love all of you as if you have done nothing. That day, it totally changed my entire concept. Like, how I look at people. See, in the natural, all our opinion are tainted with self. You know, when we like someone, we have good opinion about the person. When we don't like that someone, our opinion changes. Right? That is not walking in love. If you walk in love, your opinion remains constant. Just like a mother's love. You know, a mother, no matter how wicked her children are, to the mother, that wicked child is a beautiful angel. Am I right? How is it possible for the mother to see beyond all the flaws of her wicked child and still accept it and love it as if that wicked child has done nothing? About 20 years ago, I was speaking in a church in Australia, in Perth. And a woman gave a testimony. That on her birthday, her children, her four children invited her for a lunch. And while they were lunching, her son, I don't know what happened there, got up, pulled out a revolver from his pocket and aimed point blank at his mother. Bang! You know, if you are this close, how can the bullet miss you? Right? Cannot. But the bullet missed her. Must be an angel, right? 
came in that misa. So she was giving testimony to everybody. So I want to give thanks to God that God protected me. Okay, everybody clap their hands. Not like you all who don't clap your hands. <laughs> so everybody clap their hands and the testimony was over. And then I was introduced to speak. And just to bring a point across, I asked the mother, do you love your son? She said, yes, I love him. I said, how can that be? He pointed his revolver right at you and shot you point blank. Isn't he wicked? He's a murderer. And you know what the mother said? I love him because he's my son. Period. He's my son. No matter how wicked he is, he's my son. I love him. And she forgot about everything that happened that day. She said, he's my son. If a human can think like that, who did not die for her son, who did not give her life for her son, how much more your Savior, your Redeemer, who gave his life for you, every ounce of blood in his body was given for you. How much more him who loves you more than you can imagine. Our eyes have not seen, our ears have not heard, neither has it entered into our mind the length, the breadth, the depth and the height of the love of God. So never, 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 never doubt if God loves you. Even if the question crosses your mind, kick the question out. He loves you beyond what you would think. You know, you will never, never understand the great love that God has for you. Shall I share with you one more thing? In the year 1986, I, the Lord called me to minister to the Tibetan people living in the northern part of India. So have you heard of this state in India called Kashmir? Yeah. I'm sure it makes it to the news. Pakistan and India, my brother there. Our two great nations are fighting over the Kashmir. So anyway, so in the western part or the eastern part of Kashmir state is a province called Ladakh. So the Lord told me to go there. And in the early years of my ministry, I, I don't wear any sandals. I was walking barefoot all over India. And to walk in that region, that entire region is at 12,000 feet above sea level. And there were no transportation. It was a total barren wilderness. And I didn't know that it was a wilderness. So the Lord told me, go there. I walked for 12 days. 420 kilometers. No place to stay. There are no hotels, no lodges, no nice chalets like you have here. I had to sleep by the roadside, sleep on the snow mountains, walk on the snow mountains. This was the life. And as a result, both my feet were bruised and cut walking on the mountains. And uh, before that, uh, I was given a sandal that's made by the locals there called a hula. A hula is made of straws, the straws that the cow eat. So on the sole, there's the cow dung. You know it's a cow dung. Okay. The sole is made of cow dung. And then the straps are made of the straws. They're made of straws. So... There was a policeman who told me, you cannot go up on the high mountain because you will die of frostbite. So, at least you put on this. This is the, uh, the government regulation. I said, okay. I put it on and uh, I started walking. And uh, I did not realize how dangerous those straw sandals were. When the sun rose up, the, the sun's heat contracted 
the straw and it began to cut into my skin. And as I was walking, it was like a saw cutting into my skin. And it cut my ankles. Till today I carry all the scars in my feet, you know. They were cutting and cutting. I didn't know. I was walking for four hours, but I used to feel a little pain on my feet. I just ignored the pain. And I just walked and walked and walked and walked. At the end of the day, I thought, what is this that I feel like a pain? When I looked, my entire feet were bloodied. Blood has covered all over. And I could see the skin, inner layer of the skin, smiling at me. <laughs> I thought, oh my God, this is what that soul has done. I said, all right, I have no other med no medicine, no protection, or nothing. So I put on the shoes again, and I walked. So this was my experience for 12 days. He cut and cut and cut my feet until my whole feet was a bloody, ugly thing to look at. There were wounds all over, and pus, pus were coming out from every wound. Because I had no medicine to treat myself. And it was only the grace of God that protected me from frostbite. Because there were the Indian soldiers who, who, who monitored the border areas in the region. When they heard their testimony, they said, You know, it is truly miraculous that your God was with you. I said, Why? See, you know, many of our soldiers, their fingers, you know, when you walk up on the high mountain, your finger can melt like wax and just drop off one by one. And there are people whose legs from the ankle downwards, it has melted and has dropped off. And they've all been amputated. Their feet, their legs, all amputated. I say, you nothing? You wore nothing? And you just walk? I say, yeah, I walked. So anyway, so I walked, I finished my ministry and I came to the capital of Sri. Uh, Kashmir called Srinagar. So I, I checked in into this small little lodge to spend a night there before I take the bus to go to another city. And after checking in, I sat on the chair. Among the many, many experiences I have with the Lord, this one is the most memorable in my life. Nothing else can beat this. Because this one thing demonstrated the great love of God that no mother can match. So I sat down on the chair, looked at my feet. It's all so ugly. Even I felt it so ugly to look at, you know. So I just looking at here and there. As I was looking, I heard a voice. Is it very painful? So I turned around, I saw the Lord Jesus standing beside me. And I wanted to get up from my chair. Because, you know, in our Indian culture, you don't sit down when an elder comes before you. That's how we are brought up. And I understand South Africans have got very good culture. Like that. So I, I was about to stand and say, No, no, sit down, sit down, sit. I said, How can I sit, Lord? If I. If I won't sit before my father, how can I sit before you? I said, no, sit down. And the Lord said, take your feet and put on this table and let me take a good look at it. I said, Lord, how can I do that? I cannot do that. Because we are brought up in our culture, you don't even sit cross-legged before your elder. You don't do that. Not only before parents, but even before the siblings. If there is an older sibling, the younger won't even put up their legs on a table or cross leg before them. That's how we are brought up. I, I told the Lord, how can I do that? If I won't do that before my father, how can I do that before you? You are the guy. Again the Lord said, no, it's okay. Put it up there, let me have a good look. I said, no Lord, I can't do that. Third time he said that. Put it up. I said, no Lord. The fourth time, the Lord knelt down. He knelt down and he took my feet by his hand and lifted it up and put it on the table. 
I felt so... I felt like what Peter felt when the Lord washed his feet, you know. I understood what Peter must have felt that day. I said, Lord, how can you touch my feet? It's so ugly, dirty, and bloody. And he took my feet in his hand and turned it around this way, turned it around that way, and tears started rolling down his eyes to see all the wounds. And tears just rolled down his eyes. He didn't say any word. He just rolled down his eyes. And then he looked up. He said, My father, my son has suffered all this for me. Look at him. He has suffered so much for me. All these wounds, it's for me. Heal him. After saying, he put in his pocket, his hand, and took out a small little bottle that had oil. He took the oil, smeared in his hand, and he rubbed over the wounds on my feet. And he said, don't worry, it will be all all right. It will be all right. And then he left. You know, this is the love of God. Where else, where else can you find all this? Only the Lord Jesus Christ. Such a great love like a mother. Greater than that. You know? So never ever doubt if God loves you. There may be situations in your life, but still, nothing can separate you from the love of God. Romans chapter 8 tells us that. Nothing. No devil, no hell, no judgment day can separate you from the love of God. His love is more than anything else. You know, don't just look at the cross. The cross is just the end of something that began much earlier. The sufferings of the Lord began when He chose to be born in this world. Can you imagine he who was used to listening to the angels praising him holy, holy, holy 24-7 now as a small helpless baby lying on the manger and his ears are now listening to the songs of the mosquitoes. The mosquitoes going around ee! And he can't even use his hand to push those mosquitoes away. Helpless baby. His sufferings began then. And then, there was a threat for his life. He can't even protect himself. Joseph has to carry the baby. You see how much sufferings he went through from the day that he was born. Not what you see on the cross. From the day he was born. So it's not just... The last one week of his life that he suffered, he suffered for 33 and a half years to be rejected by his own people. Everyone doubted him, even including his own disciples. Right? Even after his resurrection, they did not even believe that he arose from the dead. Can you imagine that? Even after he showed them so many signs, he told them, meet me in Galilee. Instead of meeting him in Galilee, they went back fishing. A bunch of doubters. <laughs> Not just Thomas, you know, every one of them. We only zero in Thomas, but every one of them were doubters. Yet, yet, you know, if you read John chapter 21, so beautiful. Yet, the Lord appeared and said, Peter, do you love me? You know, if you read that portion very carefully, the Lord Jesus Christ, Peter was already under tremendous condemnation. Tremendous condemnation. So the Lord Jesus Christ came and looked at him. Didn't I tell you not to Deny me. Yes or no? 
Yes. Didn't I tell you to fast and pray? Yes or no? Didn't I tell you to watch and pray? Yes or no? Why didn't you pray? Why did you deny me? I think any one of us, wouldn't you ask her like that? Yeah. But look at the Lord Jesus. Peter denied the Lord Jesus over a campfire. He denied it. And the Lord Jesus recreated the entire scene. Brought Peter right back to the scene of action. There was a fire. And the Lord Jesus was standing there. And Peter came from the waters. He looked. As soon as he saw the fire, his mind went back to that day. When he denied the Lord Jesus before the fire. And he was shivering now. The Lord Jesus is going to ask. Why did you do that? <laughs> I think you and I would ask that question. Right? Any pastors, all pastors who are here, you will ask your own members the same question. Didn't I warn you? Wouldn't you, Mr. Pillai? Wouldn't you do that? I told you. Wouldn't you say that to Luki? <laughs> I told you. I warn you. Isn't it? But look at the Lord Jesus. He came. He said, Children, see how motherly. Children, do you have anything to eat? That's always a mother's heart, you know. The mother doesn't care about anything else. Her first thought is, the children must have food to eat. That's all her mother cares first. First, the children's stomach must be filled. Then comes number two. The fathers are not like that, no? They don't care whether the children eat or not. You know, many years ago, my mother went through a, a surgery where her womb was removed. And she went through a life and death experience. Because the doctor told us that she may die on the operating table. So we took a risk for her to go through the surgery. Anyway, uh, the surgery was successful and she was recuperating. So I went to visit her. I opened the door slowly and to see and she was, her eyes were closed, she was sleeping. So I thought I will not disturb her. And as I was pulling the door back, the door <coughs> and she opened her eyes and she called my name and she said, have you eaten? I said, how in the world you are suffering in pain and I have come to visit you and comfort you and the first thing on your mind is, has my son eaten? The same love is exhibited by the Lord Jesus. He saw the disciples. See, they forgot their call. Right? They forgot the great commission. They went back fishing. Instead of standing at the beach with a loud hail and say, You fools! What did I tell you? What are you doing there? Instead of saying that, he said, Children! Do you have anything to eat? Non-condemning love of the Lord Jesus. Right? Non-condemning. See, the Holy Spirit convicts, not condemns. Holy Spirit convicts and brings us to repentance. Right? Doesn't condemn. It's the devil who condemns. It's humans who condemn. But the goal of the Holy Spirit is to convict you and bring you to the foot of the cross. 
bring you to conviction so that you will repent and be restored. So, and they said, no, we don't have anything to eat. And the Lord said, have you caught anything? Because if they have not eaten and they have not caught anything, how are they going to eat? So the, and they said, no, we have not caught anything. So the Lord said, cast your net on the right side. When the Lord Jesus first met Peter, that was the first thing, that's the same thing that happened there. You know what the Lord Jesus said? He recreated the entire scene and brought Peter back to the first point of his call. That's what the Lord Jesus did, you know. He brought Peter back to the first point of his call, overlooking everything that Peter has ever done. He oversaw because everything was erased by his blood. And brought Peter back to the call, saying, let's start all over again. Let's forget about everything. Let's start all over again from the starting point. He said, Peter, cast your net on the right side. And when they cast the net on the right side, they caught a net load of fishes. A repeat of the first incident. And as they were pulling the net, suddenly Peter remembered, it's the Lord. Because he remembered the whole scene. It's the Lord. And they jumped into the water. And John followed after. And they ran to the beach. And sure enough, the Lord had prepared a barbecue. Isn't it? He prepared a barbecue. The, the wood was there. The fire was there. He said, come on, bring the fishes. And he put the fishes 100 and 53. Have you ever thought why John bothered to write the number 153? 1 plus 5 plus 3 is how many? You need to go back to kindergarten. <laughs> 1 plus 5 plus 3, 9. 9 gifts of the Holy Spirit. Is what the Lord Jesus was giving after his resurrection. So, after having a good meal, fish, barbecued fish, and bread, after having a good meal, then the Lord Jesus said, Peter, come, let's go for a walk. As they were walking, he put his arm around him. Peter, do you love me? See, everything is now going back to the starting point. He was dealing with the condemnation in his heart. He was feeling so condemned. You know what church tradition says? That every day for the rest of his life, whenever a cock crows, Peter will remember his denial. This is what tradition says, you know. Every time. The cock crows. He will fall on his knees and he will cry to God. Oh Lord. It, it killed him every day. And that made him humbler. And value God more. And eventually, when he was killed, he was to be crucified on the cross. He told his persecutors, I am not worthy to die like my master because I denied him. Please crucify me upside down. It was his request. Because he felt, no, I am not worthy. Because I, I denied, denied my master. Denied my savior. See, that is the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. Does not condemn. Rather, it restores. That's what the Lord Jesus said. He restored Peter back to his first love. That's what exactly he asked Peter. Come back to your first love. Let's go back. Go back. How you first followed me. And when Peter was restored, then he said, Now I'll make you fishers of men. Then he gave the last commission to them. That this is what you shall do. As soon as Peter was restored, his old nature came back. So, you know his nature of being a busybody. 
as they were walking, you know, he turned around and he said, Lord, what about that fella? That's none of your business, right? He said, what about that fella? So the Lord told him, Peter, what's your problem? I just restored you. What's your problem if it is my will that he remains till I come back again? What's your problem? You just go ahead. You just walk. This is the love of God. And let me emphasize to you, nothing, nothing can separate you from the love of God. No matter what lies the devil tells you, never, never believe them. Because nothing, nothing can separate you from the love of God. Even on the day of judgment, the Lord will stand and fight your case. That's what he does till today. The Bible says in Hebrews 7.25, He ever leaves to make intercessions for us. You know the word intercession in the original Hebrew also means fighting a case like an advocate. So he is like your attorney standing beside the fa- before the father with you by, your, by his side and fighting your case before the spirit of justice. No, my son should not be punished. He has done this. Yes, he has done that. Because he, he presents his case. You know, once I was praying for one a lady. And uh, we were praying for a long time. And then the Lord came to me. He said, what do you want? I said, Lord, I'm praying for this. He said, come, let's go before the Father and pray for this. Before I could say anything, I was up in heaven. And the Lord, I stood before the Father's throne and I was shivering like a leaf. You know, I remembered all things I read in the Bible about Moses' experience before the Father. And the Lord just put his arm around me. He said, don't worry. Let us go boldly before the throne of grace by my blood. Only by my blood you can do that. He said, come. So we walked a little closer. And then the Lord said, now you wait here. And he went closer before what looked like an ark of the covenant. And he knelt down. This is how I've seen the Lord Jesus praying. He knelt down. He lifted up his hands. And he began to pray. And I was wondering, you know, I was standing like that distance. Every now and then the Lord Jesus would point his hand like that. So I was wondering, what is he doing by pointing his hand like that? So the curiosity got the better of me. So from that corner, I walk towards this direction. Where I could see what he was trying to do. And what I saw was, he was stretching his hands and showing to the father, look at the holes. I went through all this for my daughter. And when the father looked inside the hole, he saw the entire drama of the Lord's sufferings. From the time he was arrested and from the time he died on the cross. Everything like in living movie, the father saw. And the Lord Jesus showed, I went through all this for my daughter. All this for my son. So please forgive them. Please grant them their heart's desire. So when the father sees all that, how can he say no? He said, all right, it is done. The petition is granted. This is how he pleads for you before the father's throne. Till today, he ever leaves to make intercession for us. Till today, every moment, whatever little petition you bring before the Lord, nothing is stupid, you know. Nothing is e- irrelevant. Everything to the Lord is very important. And he prays for every request one by one by one. Not collectively like what we do today. You know, on most preachers, including me, we all do that. We take, Lord, I bring all these requests before you. <laughs> Have you seen that? I do that. 
but not the Lord Jesus, you know. The very first time that I ever saw the Lord Jesus with my full eyes was in November 1983. I was praying, fasting and praying the whole day. And at the end of my prayer session, the Lord Jesus walked into my room wearing a beautiful blue colored robe. And he walked in and he said, I have come to pray with you. And on my table, there were 300 letters to pray for. No? So I was going to take all the 300. From my father, I bring all these requests before you. You know, if you, if you spend two minutes for one letter, 300 letters are going to be 600 minutes. How many hours is that? Do you think you have that time in the world? No. We always like to fool ourselves that we are busy people. Isn't it? So, I was going to do that when the Lord came. I have come to pray with you. I was shocked because I have never ever heard anything like this before. Before I could say anything, he knelt down beside me. And that was my second shock. How can the king of the whole universe kneel down beside a mere mortal dust? And uh, I was just too shocked to react or say anything. And before I could say anything, he said, let's pray for all these letters. So I, I then plucked up some courage and I told the Lord, I said, Lord, I do not know what all these requests are. Shall I read to you one by one? He looked at me and he had a smile. <laughs> you know what that means? That smile. And he said, lay your hands on the letters. I laid my hands. And he took his hand and laid on my hand. He said, now, let's pray. And I, I don't even know what was written in all those letters. And instead of closing my eyes, you know, this was a grand, rare opportunity that I got. I don't want to miss it, you know. So instead of closing my eyes, I kept my eyes open and I turned my head to look at how the Lord Jesus prayed. He tilted up his head heavenwards and tears rolled down his eyes like non-stop rivers. It flowed and it flowed and it flowed and he was sighing. You know, his entire body was shaking and moving, groaning. No words came out of his mouth. He was just sighing and groaning. And it went on for a long time. And then he turned to me and he said, Okay, this is the answer you write to the first letter. You mean all this <laughs> was just for the first letter? <laughs> I would have done all that for all the 300. <laughs> all that was just for the first letter. And then he said, let's go to the second letter. One by one by one. All the 300 letters. He said, this is how you reply to the first letter. This is how you reply to the second. All the 300 letters. And then he got up. He laid his hands and he blessed me and he left. From that day onwards, my eyes were opened. From that day onwards, every time I pray, I have this experience. The Lord walks in. Or he comes and he said, okay, this is how you shall pray. This is how we will do together. Or in a meeting like this, he stands by my side and points a finger at people. He said, tell them this thing. This is what they are thinking in their heart. But the, the point that I want to bring across to you is this. Everyone matters. Everyone matters. No matter how sometimes, according to my opinion, idiotic her request is, or so mundane, you know, something so mundane, why make it a point of prayer? This is my personal opinion. But to the Lord, it is very important. Because it matters to my daughter. It matters to my son. So it is important to me. And he takes it up before the father in prayer. 
This is how the Lord cares for you. This is how the Lord prays for you. So when you have such a loving father, why would you think he doesn't love you? Tell me, why would you think that? You shouldn't, right? Why would you think? Why would you ever doubt that there's no one in this world? Of course there's no one in this world who loves you. Am I right? But there is a God. You know, one day, I was sleeping on the rooftop in my house. And I was thinking, you know, oh Lord, I have nobody in this world. I have no father, mother, brother, sister. I give up everybody to follow you when you call me. No house, no lands, no father, no mother. They all, they were alive at that time. But I've already left everybody when the Lord called me. I said, Lord, I give up my youth. I give up this, I give up that. Now I have nobody, Lord. You know, that one silly day, I felt so uh, despondent. You know, I, I just spoke to the Lord this. And instantly, the Lord appeared by my side and He said, Because you obeyed me and you gave up your family, look what I have given to you. When He said, Look, I saw on one side many angels came and stood. On another side, saints from heaven. And on another side, martyrs from heaven. He said, look at them. These are your relatives. These are your brothers. This is your new family that I have given to you because you chose to give up your natural. When I saw that that day, I fell at the feet of the Lord and I cried and I cried. How stupid I was trying to yearn after something that is of the flesh when what the Lord has given to me, no money can buy. Right? No money can buy. You know, this is far more precious than anything else. That is why in, no matter what kind of sufferings or persecutions I go through in the ministry, this is my comfort. You know? When I'm all alone, you know, walking in the mountains in Tibet, in Nepal, all alone, no food to eat, no, no. sometimes there's not even water to drink. You know, for miles and miles, for hours we walk in barren wilderness. There's no water to drink. On one occasion I was so thirsty, I said, Lord, please give us some water to drink. And, we, and I came across a small little pond. Small little pond. And I thought, Lord, thank you for answering our prayer. When I look into the water, there were a million mosquito lavas. I said, Lord, how to drink this water? And that's the only water. So I scooped the water. And again, there were millions of mosquito lavas, tepos, you know. They were all wriggling like that. So I said, Lord... You can't tell them, move away. <laughs> Can you? You can't. Now, I have two choices. Either I drink that water, or I keep on walking with thirst. So, I prayed, Lord, I sanctify this water by your blood. Let all the lavas die now. I drank it. To prove that the lavas literally died, See, I'm alive. <laughs> you know, this is how God takes care of us. When you choose to sacrifice for the Lord, when you choose to give up, when the Lord makes a demand on your life, how can He be so unkind to forget the sacrifices that you have made. How can he be so unkind? You know, once Peter asked the Lord Jesus this question, Lord, for your sake, we gave up our homes, we gave up our families, we gave up this, we gave up that, and we followed you. Now you are saying that you are going to die. 
So what about us? And the Lord Jesus replied, If any man who has left his father, mother, wife, family, children, lands, houses for my sake, he will get lands, fathers, mothers, children, houses in this world and in the world to come. You know, if you analyze the scripture very carefully, you gave up one house and the Lord said, I give you houses. You gave up one land and the Lord said, I give you lands. You give up one father, he said, I'll give you fathers. You give up brothers and sisters and you get more. These are blessings not only in heaven, but the Lord said, in this world, and in the world to come. So the Lord blesses you. You may suffer a little poverty for a season. But that poverty for that season is a test. To see if you will stay faithful. You will stay carrying your cross and walking after God without grumbling. Without asking for anything. But carrying the cross with great joy. He tests you for a season. After the season, he says, Okay, now you will be blessed. You shall no more hunger. You shall no more thirst. You shall no more have any lack. This is a promise. For the life that you are willing to live sacrificially for the Lord Jesus Christ. God is a kind God, you know. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 10 tells us he remembers the sacrifices we have made. He remembers them. It's all written in his book. You know, God keeps a book. In the book, he has written all the sacrifices you have done for him. And when your cup is filled, full, he will reward you openly. And he waits for your cup to be full. All the good works you have done. All the sacrifice you have done. When he reaches its brim. And when it's about to tilt over. He will send forth his blessings upon you. If you want a scriptural proof for that. is found in Acts chapter 10. An angel visits Cornelius. And the angel tells him. Oh Cornelius. All the good works that you have done. Has reached heaven. Now God has sent me to you. To tell you to go and send for a man called Peter. And when he comes, he will preach to you and you will receive a rich reward for all the good that you have done. See, all the good that you do, the sacrifices you make, the gifts that you give to the poor, it all adds up one on top of another. You are laying up treasures in heaven. And when they reach the full... God will reward you openly. He's a good God. More than your eyes can imagine. You know? That is why I am saying to you with all certainty. Even the Lord Jesus said, not even tribulation can separate you from the love of God. Right? So, for the Lord to say not even tribulation can separate you from the love of God, which means... You must be around during the tribulation. Right? So which means the rapture won't come before that. It will come after that. Even during the tribulation. When all hell breaks loose on this earth. Only first part of hell. Because the second part of hell comes after. During the wrath of God. The first part when you are hunted like animals. Because you refuse to take the mark of the beast. You are hunted like animals. You are chased from pillar to post. You are running. You don't have food to eat, no water to drink because you refuse to take the mark. No buying, no selling. During that period of time, you will feel abandoned by God. Forsaken by God. The Bible says, even during that period, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. Can you believe that? Did you believe that? Really? So you won't take the mark? Would you? No. 
What if a knife is put at your throat? Are you sure? Where's your mother? What if they put a knife at your mother's throat? What? What if they kill her? You know, this is a true incident that happened in Syria. One day, a mother, mother, father, two daughters, that makes a family. The mother was praying and the Lord spoke to her. Can you lay yourself on the altar? She said, no problem, Lord. Yes, Lord, I lay myself on the altar. Two days later, she was praying and the Lord spoke to her. Can you lay your husband on the altar. Oh, oh. She pondered. You see? She is not as brave as you are. So she pondered. She told the Lord, I need to discuss with my husband first. <laughs> so she went and talked with the husband. Say, hey, honey, this is what the Lord said. What do you think? So the husband told her, what is that to think? And they knelt down, they held hands together, they prayed, and committing husband and wife together on the altar for the Lord. They, they did not understand the meaning of all this thing. You know, if you put yourself on the altar, it means you are putting yourself on the sacrifice, right? So, a few days later, she was praying. And the word of the Lord came to her, my dear daughter, will, can you put your two daughters on the altar? She said, oh my God. She went few steps backwards. She didn't know what to answer. She's got two lovely daughters, little girls, eight and six. She pondered and pondered and pondered for a few days. Then, they had a family prayer. She called her two girls. They sat down and she told her girls, you know, what it means to be a martyr. She explained to her girls. She said, one fine day, bad men with hoops over their head may walk into a house and they may kill daddy. They may kill mummy. When that happens, you must close your eyes tight. Shut tight. Don't open your eyes and see. But when you feel a knife on your neck, open your eyes, look at the man who is putting the knife at your neck and tell him, Jesus loves you and I forgive you. So the mother told this to the little girls and the girls understood everything the mother said and the four of them held hands together and they prayed. And they committed themselves on the altar of the Lord. So that was the end of everything. Some days passed by, maybe a week passed by. One morning, blessed morning or fateful morning, the door was banged open and four hooded men walked into the house and they shouted, Allahu Akbar. You know what it means, right? Don't you know? It means God the Great. And saying that, he went straight to the husband. Will you renounce Jesus Christ as Savior and accept Islam? He said, no. <coughs> and they cut the neck of the husband and he fall dead. Like a wood will fall down. And then they came and the wife was there, the children were there. And the two girls remembered what the mother said. And they shut their eyes tight. And the older one held on the hands of the younger one. Real tight. And told her sister, close your eyes. Don't open and see at any cost. And next they heard the voice of the man speaking to the mother. Will you renounce Christ and accept Allah? She said, no. Boom. And they heard the son. <coughs> the body of the mother dropping on the ground. And a little later, the older girl felt something sharp on her neck. 
Are you going to change your mind now? No. And she opened her eyes. She saw her killer. And the little girl remembered what the mother said. She said, Jesus loves you. And I forgive you. The two girls dropped it. An entire family was killed. This is a true incident that happened in Syria not too long ago. It is coming, you know. It's around the corner. Persecution is coming. The church must get ready to face this. We will not be caught away. That won't come first. But we have to go through all this. This will be the final test of purification for the bride of Christ. Final test of purification. This will separate the wheat from the tares. This will separate the sheep from the goats. Today, they are all mixed together. You won't even know who are the true believers, who are the false believers. Everybody are together in one lump. But that will force you to align yourself, force you to look at your own feet. Those who are lukewarm, they will definitely swing over. Say, no, I renounce Christ. I don't want this Christ. You know, already, apostasy is being slowly creeping into the church, where even Christian churches are teaching that Islam and Christianity are one. They are teaching that. That kind of a teaching called Chrislam is creeping into the church very stiltily like a snake, slithering slowly into the church where they are now beginning to openly embrace. No harm. After all, we are worshipping the same God. It's not true. Allah and God is not the same. They are not the same. You know, if you go, I'm sorry, I'm already late. I should stop now. Uh, my boss should say, no? It's okay. That those are non-essential information. Okay. Listen, I'm not an expertise on all this subject. But I'm just share with you. Allah, in pre-Islamic Arabia, they worship 360 idols. This is all documented. And among the 360 idols, Allah is one of them. Is one among the 360 idols. It, he is not, like what Islam teaches today, the one supreme God. No, that's not true. In real pre-Islamic Arabia, you can Google it. Pre-Islamic Arabia, that's where I got all this information. It's not revelation. Information. <laughs> I was shocked, you know, when I made that discovery. Oh, Allah is not the supreme God. All my life, I, this is what I heard. Allah is the supreme God. Haven't you heard that? But it's not true. He is one among 360 idols. Worshipped by pre-Islamic Arabians. When Muhammad came, he got rid of 359 and lifted up one idol. Say, so let's make this one idol our supreme God. That's how Allah became the one supreme God and 359 were kicked out. Now you tell me, can that idol equal to the great God Jehovah? No! No! We are not worshipping the same God. Our God, Lord God Jehovah, is the one, only, supreme creator of the whole universe. Amen! 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 So they are not equal. If they are not equal, Islam and Christianity cannot coexist. No way! No way it can coexist. No way it can be become one. There's only one God. And the Lord Jesus is His name. Amen. 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 But, you know, 
There is a saying, if you can't fight them, join them. Have you heard of that? So, the devil cannot fight the church, so he decided to join the church. So, he brought Islam into the church. Say, come on, we are all together. You have Abraham, we have Ibrahim. See? You have Isaac, we have Ishaq. You have Jacob, we have Yaakov. You have Jesus, we have Isa. See, the same. We are from the same father, Ibrahim. So, let's worship together. You know, it's growing fast in the US today. It's growing fast. And I just received a report yesterday from a prayer ministry that in one church in the US, the bishop in that city has issued an order to all the churches to, to remove every cross from their churches. No symbol of the cross or Christianity should be found in their churches. Because if non-Christians come, they should not feel threatened. They should feel comfortable to come into a church. This is number one. Number two, every church should have a Muslim prayer room. And the Muslim prayer room should be facing Mecca. This has started. This has started. And you know, about two, three years ago, President Obama was going to visit a church in California. Have you heard of this book called The Purpose Driven Life? Okay. Rick Warren. Obama was visiting his church. So before Obama came, Obama issued, laid out some condition. He said, okay, I'll come to your church. Number one, you, every picture of Christ must be covered with a cloth. Every cross, everything, nothing should be there when I come into your church. And guess what? Rick Warren complied. And they put a cloth, I saw those pictures, you know. They covered all the pictures of Christ, all the crosses were all covered with a drip. And then Obama stood at the pulpit and he talked politics. And Rick Warren is one, is the chief representative from the Christian circle to propagate Chrislam. And this is spreading fast. Spreading fast. Spreading fast all over the world. Not only spreading fast, I should also talk faster and finish quickly now. See, this is a sign. <laughs> Amen.